Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our speaker today, Professor Frederick Simons, and he's a professor at Princeton University at the Department of Geoscience, and he's also an associated faculty member at the Princeton High Meadows Environmental Institute and the Program in Applied and Computational Mathematics. Um, before joining Princeton, he was a lecturer at the University of College London for a few years and also a postdoc at Princeton University. And he obtained his bachelor and master's degree at KU Leuven in Belgium, and his uh, PhD at MIT in 2002, geophysics. And yeah, so if I can quote a sentence from his website, he said, no amount of, of uh, sophistications can cure the limitations uh, of the data. So I guess he's very good at uh, developing computational and theoretical methods to conduct detailed analysis of uh, data. So well, here's some interesting um, topic about inverse mini inverse problem and special methods to study Earth planets and space. Let's welcome. Um, actually, that sentence is there to advertise that I'm working on developing a physical instrument to go mm -hmm. to places that nobody's ever gone to, which is in the oceans. But I won't be talking about at all about that today because um, I've been dying to give this talk here to try and bridge geoscience, geophysics, you know, whatever, and, and we meet through the problems that we solve, not the solutions necessarily that we find, as you know, from, you know, meeting me, but I know nothing about variable density or neutron stars or anything, but we're all modelers, we're all doing inference, we are solving in geoscience primarily inverse problems, and I just want to just uh, hit some of those points, which I think are really uh, good for, for both of us as a larger community. Uh, to hit upon. Um, toyed with a variety of subjects in the end, I ended up putting a bunch of things together and I called out the lamp platner here because the towards the end, if I make it, and I'm happy to be interrupted and not make there, I'll, I'll uh, increase the concentration of the things that I did more recently with him. But I'm going to start uh, early. So first of all, I don't know if we even speak the same vocabulary, right? So spatial spectral localization, huh? You know, what is that? But a quick look, um, papers in the literature, the depth of Jupiter's great red spot, um, Mercury's gravity field, the shape of Ceres, uh, solar magnetism and sunspot. In each of these papers, including one of them that I co-authored and one that I advised on, um, so it's a bit self-serving here, but there are key notions of spatial spectralization that, that have aided in the analysis of this source of data. So I'm going to try and explain that bit of the story and then give numerous uh, applications. So there's going to be three types of problems, all drawing upon this sort of uh, thing, and then four or five uh, applications, which are sort of illustrations of where that's been and where it's going. So first, there's a little bit of mathematics, and this is, you know, you cannot both be small or finitely supported in K space or in, and in X space at the same time. And that's not the Heisenberg principle, but that's the Bailey Wiener theorem that says that you cannot both live on a bound limited section of spectral space and on a space limited spa section of spatial space. But what you can do is you can try to get the best of both worlds. You can either completely band limit something and then try to squeeze it into a region, or you can completely uh, space limited and then try to squeeze it into a, a spectral region. Sorry, so why isn't it the Heisenberg principle? Because the Heisenberg principle says that this that the width scale, right, it's a sort of uncertainty product, but it doesn't say that if there is even one zero point in uh, a spectrum that there can, that there must be full support in the opposite. It's a Paley Wiener theorem, not the Heisenberg. I myself uh, made that mistake, and it was pointed out to me by a reviewer. So now I go around evangelizing. So um, to cut to the chase, you know, my regions of interest are blobs, continents, you know, or they could be caps. We rotate it around like a detector, or they could be double caps, or they could be latitudinal bands, like you which will see, you know, from cosmology. And the, in a nutshell, the, the result of trying to do this gives you a new function basis. So no more Fourier modes, but you get these special functions called slipping functions. 
and I'll be showing you some applications of how to use them both as a basis for representing things, for approximating things, for inverting things onto them, um, or just as appetization windows, kernels to do uh, get you know, desirable behavior specifically for spectral density estimation. And theory is very, very old, but we're doing it on the sphere and that makes it sort of geo. Uh, I do want to start with the very, very basics, and that's from the 50s, right? So in, when, when Shannon and Slepkin, and Landau and Pollack were at Bell Labs, they were faced with the problem of trying to transmit information on band-limited copper lines. And then they asked the question, what if you have a one-minute phone conversation on a poorly transmitting band-limited device? How much information can you actually squeeze in there? And so they were saying, like, look, you know, for a, for a function that is band limited, so it is exactly represented by, you know, negative W to W, that's a, a finite support for your transform function. How can you make sure that you squeeze as much uh, power as possible in a time limited interval? And the solutions are perhaps well known to you because it's, it, it comes in a variety of guises here. But so the eigenfunctions, these G's here, which I colored in this color, are eigenfunction of this operator, which is just a sync curve. So this you will recognize from you know basic interpolation uh, theory, and they uh, found, in other words, the eigenfunctions of this integral operator, and those are the slapping functions in one D, and perhaps very popular in geophysics and seismology, perhaps some of you have used them as papers to do, you know, spectral analysis of some kind in, in time. In 2D or 3D, or rather in Cartesian space, the, the story is essentially the uh, same. And that is that uh, if you're asking to get a function that is supported on a finite domain, K, and you try to subsequently squeeze as much of it as possible in a, some spatial domain R, then again, you're getting solutions that are uh, eigenfunctions of this blue kernel here, which is once again a sort of similar looking uh, twice. So all of that existed in 1960, but what didn't exist when we started it in the years, you know, I don't know, 2007 or eight or something, actually a little earlier, we asked ourselves, well, what if the spectral, what if it's a spherical harmonic type of thing? What's if it's sphere geometry? And what if the functions are exactly band limited? So, you know, zero to L or could be band passed, you know, in other words, finite support. How much of those functions can you squeeze into an arbitrary region on the sphere? And lo and behold, of course, you know, the functions again are now eigenfunctions of a, another integral uh, equation. And, you know, this is their kernel. This is what they look like, okay? So if you're saying I have 16 or 17, I think, uh, uh, spherical harmonic degrees, and I'm trying to concentrate them in a cap, you know the spherical harmonics are everywhere, but the slepian functions here, I'm enumerating them from, this is the very, very best one, the second best, the third best, the fourth best, and so we can enumerate them. And that's a new basis for anywhere on the sphere that you want to expand functions. And these are the first 16 elements or whatever. There's some limit in which they become the same as the spherical harmonics? No, not, not unless R equals omega and it's completely degenerate and it's one to one map. There is no. Sorry, what are R and omega here? R is the uh, finite support of the area right there, and omega is all of the sphere. Awesome. So if the region is the sphere, then you're done. Then you like you shouldn't have bothered. But if the region is missing as much as one point, then you have a whole new function basis, and you're losing, or, or rather you're gaining uh, by this transformation because then you have rebasis uh, uh, onto something. One thing that you're not pulling into this problem is like the typical sizes of the KLMs. Usually, when we do this in cosmology, yeah. there is some CLs, yeah, and so this. Prefers some part of the that would break your lambda degeneracy. Well, so so I'm here. I'm focusing on the band uh, pass, you know, zero to something, and I'm focusing on you know this is a simple illustration, right? But it 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 exists in complete generality. I'm not sure what you're asking because I'm just saying that, for example, if. Uh, your organization of these mode functions, if the power of the signal is, say, some power law in L, that increases, will maybe organize in a different way. Of course, that's, that's, 
Yes, you, I'm just giving you the basis. I'm not organizing them in any other way than by which one is most spatially concentrated in this dash circle and then the next one, the next one. In this example here, they're all really good and there's thousands of them, but we are going to project them onto what their structure matters, right? This is just the basis. It's like I'm showing you sines and cosine. What's the significance of the dash circle on these? That's where I'm trying to contain the function into. So we're looking at the North Pole, it's just a disk, or it's a cap, it's a spherical cap. So maybe this point is better that, you know, like arbitrary Africa, you know, still the same limitation of circle harmonic degrees. What is the function basis appropriate for Africa? And here again, there's not weighted, it's just ordered by decreasing ability of putting that information inside of Africa. And if you want the cosmological example for where you're trying to have both polar caps or one minus both polar caps, you know, this is the, uh, the, the, the one version and you could do the opposite version, then, you know, these are the functions that come out. And they're not zero outside, but they are small and they fa have fast decay and all sorts of properties. And what's the physical meaning of the lambda, which I see is getting very small? The la so I mean, at the top, I show you the first few high lambdas. And at the bottom, I show you the lowest, lowest lambda. So these are, you know, almost 100% in the polar caps, and these are 0% almost into the polar caps. So the physical meaning is just that ratio of energy concentration. Okay. But so these things, and I'll show you in a second, you know, they're eigenvalue problems. So there is an eigenvalue. That's why we call it lambda muscle. But it is just a proportion of energy that you manage to squeeze into the target region. If I had chosen G cubed or G to the four instead, would it, would yeah. So you know, it's like G to the fractional anything is something uh, you know absolute value. Any type of norm, you know, give you the same basis. No, right? There's something unique about this quadratic that works, you know, beautifully, and there are extensions to other powers, and then it's more brute force. Everything we can do here, thanks to the, the squaredness. You know, for a very long time, keeping symmetry, we can do everything analytically. And that's, uh, that's sort of part of the appeal. Is it only for single region or are there multiple regions? Single? Oh, is it only for the single region or you can no. multiple? So any finite subspace of space, that's why I had the two patches, R1 and R2, so you can localize to Belgium and Africa, you know, at the same time. Or to one point, a line, and an area, you can Right. It's it's and that, that's kind of important because it turns out that many of the properties don't depend on what the region is, but only on its area. In in the one-dimensional case, what's the relation of these things to wavelets? Oh, very different. So the, the in, in one D or in any D, you know, we're used to thinking of if you can see it, you know, negative to plus infinity. And now I'm saying. Give me a basis for here, and I've decided it's going to be there in R or in negative G to T or something like that. Wavelets don't predecide where they'll be, and they will cascade and tile the axis, and then you will subdivide. And so here we're making the geometric constraint a priori, a priori. And so wavelets have different frequency response depending on how wide their spatial or temporal support is, whereas these all have the same support built in, and you'll see it in a second. So they're all sensitive to the same frequency band by design, not in the same way. So in case phase, you know, this would be frequency or something, you know, you're tempted to see these things this is the target, and then the next function is going to look like this, and the next function is going to look like this, and the next function is going to look like this with, with side lobes. So they're all confined to the target, whereas for wavelets, maybe I should draw it here, the support is wider as the spatial thing that shrinks. If I have a finite region, is it more efficient? to use the Slepian functions or to use the wavelets? So um, I have a whole other talk because I've done a whole lot of other work on wavelets. 
And so there are, uh, depends on the nature of the signal, on the stationarity of the property. Sometimes it's the answer is one and sometimes the, the answer is the other. Okay. Um, I, I did not mention any of that here, but I, we have worked on that. Maybe, uh, I know we're going to. Yeah, please. Things, but I guess uh, just a little bit repeating, but uh, what I was saying before, but I think when we do similar thing in cosmology, for example, get the modes for analyzing a given survey that has some patch on the sky, but the other issue that happens is that uh, the noise is not the same. Yeah. So we end up doing an eigenvalue problem, yeah. signal to noise. Yeah. Similar to this, but it's, uh, you know, those two, what the signal look like as a yeah. function of spectrum and the spatial distribution of yeah. the noise goes into defining the functions. That we so have. these are just the building blocks with which that is possible. Yeah, you can then do a second step. Yeah. Actually, we will go direct to solving some you know matrix linear algebra to get the instead of your things that's some yeah and that's why you know so our lambda is directly signal to noise so then we would say we only keep the first x because of the signal to noise of i don't know point one right. and, then and so that, that that's what we call and you presume we do that's regularization right so we're, we're going to show that if you use this function basis then you're doing an expansion in them and then you need to adjust the terms based on signal and noise and we, we have worked on all of those statistics and that is very uh, so here i'm just on the building blocks they don't know anything all they know now is geometry right here on this slide but i want to show you how 1d 2d 3d you know which rather is 3d so they're all the same type of problems they're all controlled by a spectrally limited delta function. So if, if the support here were all of frequency, this would be delta function, the delta function, delta function in 1D, 2D, or, or spherical geometry. And so what matters is the trace of this operator, which is the area of frequency bandwidth that you're targeting. And that's, that controls all of this behavior. And so TW is the area in space spectrum and K squared area of, you know, spectral area versus spatial area. And it's the same in L plus one squared. That's the dimension of the spherical harmonics and then the area over the four pi. And so um, they are just new combinations of Fourier modes that have all of these properties. And then you could make your recipe with it and, and um, design them in, in other ways. Another way that, that perhaps comes up is, or rather it hasn't come up, is, is related to this question and your question. Like instead of g squared, clearly you could build in, and we have done this too, you could ask for g r this, where you can build in an inverse proportionality to the noise covariance. And so that's all generalization that we have also uh, discussed, but I don't want to detail now. So, so this is as literally as old as the street, except the 3D thing didn't, um, hadn't really been worked out. And so if I do the same thing, but now to explicitize that eigenvalue problem, if you do the spectral solution, then you get the eigenfunctions of this operator, which I call big D LNM. And again, it has the same traits. So um, the, the, a little bit about the eigenvalues, right? So. The key feature of trying to do this is that they're stair-like, which means that if you sum them, you know, the sum of the eigenvalues is about the halfway point. And so that is um, what allows you to target projecting signal that lives on the cap, you know, onto these high eigenvalues compared to the low ones, because there's an infinite, you know, null space sometimes where you just don't have any. This is the case for various uh, bandwidth for Africa, Eurasia, and so on. So they, they maintain that character, but the shape of the region matters in, in, in the eigenvalue decay. And people study what is the width of the transition region, what is the rate of the decay, what is what is that. But again, it's all geometry at this point, right? So it's just a geometric construction. And all of that structure is real? Real valued? No, no, the, uh, the little... Uh, bumps in the uh, so they, that that you know so the the you know the asymptotics are we know exactly what this looks like and now you know Africa is basically extra modes onto something and so that influences so this is exact it's not 
imaginary. It's not real. It, I mean, it, it's not made up. It's not noise. There's no data right? in this case. I'm going to skip over this. So, you know, you all know the spherical harmonic basis is we're talking about omega, the entire sphere. Now we're dealing with an operator that is a, a, a gram matrix, a, a coupling matrix of something that's only a partial sphere, and we're working with the eigenfunctions of that. So, um, you know, that, that was a nutshell. We've, we've done this for scalar fields. We've also done it for vector fields, and it's also been done for tensor fields. So I'm just going to give you some examples. Um, if your signal, because you're targeting a region, is you know really living there, then this is a good expansion. If you switch from spherical harmonics to slapping functions and you keep the space together, it's a it's an orthogonal transform. You haven't done anything. But if you're targeting a region, because of this eigenvalue decay, the signal is well approximated in the region to some amount. And then that's where these things come. We work on the statistics of what is the mean squared reconstruction error of projecting a signal that lives on a space to a certain sub basis. And then that clearly depends on the signal you want to show you detail the statistics of those things for a variety of distributions. It's all analytical if it's white noise and white signal, but it's it's computational if you have colored noise or or, or things that you don't parameterize as well. So, a bunch of spectral harmonics for Africa. If you try to do here, is this is a, a manifestation of the Earth's crustal magnetic field anomaly. This is basically how the, the, the radial component of the Earth's magnetic field that is not related to the core varies across the Earth. And if I expand the spatial map of the Earth into spherical harmonics, then I hit 5,000 coefficients because I need all of them. The square, the triangle taken out here is, is the core field. So if you're interested in Africa or a subpiece of Africa by the blue circle here, in order to represent that in this global basis, you'll still need 5,000 coefficients. You just need to recombine them, which I did there. So I recombine the harmonics such that they just give me that piece of the anomaly. That's not compression of any kind. That's just arranging things. The key now is that if you, instead of using that old global basis, you use this Taylor basis, which ends up you know, being this transform, here are those functions again. And now you are able to express this piece of real estate in, you know, 40 odd coefficients because you have realized while you cover the entire bandwidth that you really wanted only a very small space, piece of your domain. And intuitively that should allow you to use fewer building blocks to make that. And that is exactly what happens. So despite that there's a uh, full set, you only need a few. Yes. And so the reduction is coming from this L plus one squared A over four pi. That's the reduction. <clears throat> Squeezing it depending on how little fraction of the area you are covering. And you could go all the way out, and then you could be literally do do that. And be like, well, how about a few more or a few less? And then that depends on signal to noise ratio. But if you're just, let's say, just to see the behavior, compressing something. On a few modes, well, if you want to target this region of space, then you know this will do it for you know the circle in Africa. But um, to be a devil's advocate, yeah. the stuck-in functions are presumably all numerical. No, so well, okay, yes and no. Um, when there is advanced symmetry, caps, double caps, reflections, and certain things, they're all analytical. When they are as much as one pixel. It has to be numerical. And there is a devil's advocate, because if you say, you know, it's going to be arbitrary and random, and you're gritting that, and you're doing an SVD or an empirical orthogonal function or some mode decomposition, you are going to get this type of behavior. But by going the analytical route, we understand the behavior much, much better. And so that's where the uh, contributions lie, because we're looking at where the we're driving the analytics and the statistics as far as we can so that we get a complete understanding. So if you were to give a circle 
to some SVD, I would tell you that's what the structure will look like because we can do this analytically before you've even done it. But I'll concede the point that if it's just all arbitrary and you're going to do SVDs anyway, then but then in geophysics and presumably in cosmology, but also in geodesy, if you were to try to diagonalize a vast system, it would be computationally demanding. Whereas if you knew ahead of time what the geometry is, you could target that and that, that would lead to great efficiency. And that's in fact what we do. When you say analytical, you mean the all special functions or just the So I mean that the, 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 the this is that. Um, if there is advanced symmetry of this kind, then that integral operation commutes with a differential operation. And that is a prolate for a wave operator. And that has elliptical eigenfunctions and eigenvalues made out of special functions that are not having any computability issues almost ever, not since 1954. And so that's how far you can you can carry. But knowing that, you can do all the rest of it analytically too. And so that has the that's a side story. Are they in Mathematica? Uh, don't use Mathematica. They are in in all sorts of other things. The, the they're in you know if I say they're in Python, does that make you happier? Or they're in MATLAB or they're in R? But like yeah, I bet they are. Um, so earthquakes. Okay, an earthquake goes off, it changes the Earth's gravity field. Okay, if you didn't know that, now you know. Well, okay, moving mass around your compressor. So very early on, after plotting a few of these functions, of course, we recognize that the modes by which faults happen, you know, like that's analytical theory, you know, these are ways in which the focal sphere of an earthquake would excite, you know, dilation and compression and shear and so on. And so you're just noticing that these things look alike, right? which immediately tells you, that's the same thing. It immediately tells you that if you look at something like time variable gravity, that you should be able to find the gravitational expression of earthquakes, okay? Here's a picture of one month of the GRACE satellite. This is a potential perturbation compared to a, an average expressed as a geoidal height. So this is the millimeters of the equipotential motion and you're seeing a whole bunch of noise and a bunch of stripes because there's all sorts of aliasing with the orbits of the satellite and the tides and so on. So I'm making the point that if you just get the data products from NASA to get, you know, the, how much a gravity field, what it was looking like in, you know, this month, you get something like this. And here, the next figure is the next month. Okay. You did not see this change because our eyes are not good at doing analysis, but I'm pointing to that region here, because in that region, at that time, there was a massive, massive earthquake. This was the Great Sumatra and the earthquake. So the question is, where is the influence of the Great Sumatra and the earthquake, which I know is in space right there, and I have an idea of where it locates in the spectrum, but if I look at all of it, I just literally don't see it. People try, they look, you know, they cut it out, they smooth, but anyway, so that's... What I'm saying is, if I take two of my slapping functions and I just do the transform once, right, and I project all the spherical harmonics given to me by the NASA product, and I just project it onto the two functions, and I do this for every month, this is every blue dot, and I center it on Sumatra, immediately you pick out that there is the earthquake because this is the potential perturbation due to that earthquake. This is in two components. And if you're just one epsilon more of a geologist, you'll notice that I'm plotting the islands and I'm plotting a great subduction zone. And then you're saying, please rotate this basis. And so if you rotate that basis to align with where the earthquake literally pushed down, then all of the signal is on here and the component of which has nothing, which gives you a signal to noise ratio relation, and then you could do it again. And of course, you could take multiple modes and so on, but that's compression. That's a geophysical knowledge that allows you to make a basin for something that you know behaves in a certain way, and that with one step, this like it was always not even a paper worth of material to just compress it and do it and you see it. How do you choose the size of the cat? And then we were so you know, if you go back to predictions, 
like the top here is normal mode calculations of what it should be. And then we target the size of the cap to that. But in fact, there is a trial and error and a play phase where we say, okay, could it be large and small? Because that's the parameters we're not control, the size of the cap and the bandwidth. Same question it asked for the bandwidth. And here is it depends on the signal that excites certain modes and it's going to decay at a certain rate. Right? So regarding this operation, like, I mean, this is a linear algorithm, like how, like, if you have auto encoders or something, can you like even boil down information even further, like even lesser components? Well, I mean, like in this case, it's a one component, but you plus an orientation, right? I mean, so it's like no, no, no. and eigenvectors and, you know, you need to know the vector and then you have it. Um, not in this case, like in the previous this triangle plot that you showed. Oh. Can you even further down reduce it by a nonlinear? Well, so that's where then I would go to waveless. And in fact, I'm going to maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, I think I'll, I'll answer some of that later. Yeah, there's no way that earthquake works. Would you be able to? Yeah, well, so we did this for the world's earthquakes, right? If you don't know where it is, and this is where the analytics come in, you make a cap and you rotate it. And because it's analytical, you can write the rotation matrix and you do it by FFT and you're basically doing all of it all at once because you have the freedom of putting the cap anywhere at any location and then orienting it anywhere. And so there is a fast algorithm that will give you an alpha, beta, gamma rotate around the sphere. So it's a little detector. So you could sky scan or do whatever you do in looking for things and you just, it's, 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 very efficient that way. And then, of course, if you don't know what to look for, well, then you know, like the, the science needs to come in at some point, right? So, so far, it's geometry combined with little science. So, you know, um, geophysics, right? This is the great satellites. We want to touch on the cosmology because we are here, and you are you. Where is the common problem? And again, it's a, it's a simplification, right? But we have data and it's limited to a certain area, okay? We are going to have a noise model and let's assume it's uncorrelated with the signal. Let's consider the noise covariance known or consider that you can learn it. And that's my way of saying is that we've got noisy and incomplete data on the surface of the sphere. So if the data is a signal component and a noise component inside a region of interest, and you have, let's say, zero mean noise, and you know there's noise covariance, and you know it's uncorrelated with the signal. This, of course, this noise covariance can have any shape, but you know, you have to, all I'm saying is let it exist, okay? Noisy, I just showed you, right? Noisy data, I've got plenty of those, and I'm sure you do too. Incomplete, well, you know, I had Africa, but you have the sky cut, or you have a detector, or a beam, or some area of space that you want to scan for something. So you have geographical a prioris that you can make in a portion of the sky, just like I can with Africa or some piece of the country. Problem number one is a linear problem is to say, well, I made a basis. Now I'm trying to project my signal onto it. Will I find the coefficients that well represent it? That's, an, that's not like I just showed you an approximation problem, but that's an inverse problem where you know it, 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 it includes this noisy uh, consideration. So the problem there is given the data and given the noise covariance, try to find the signal component. Okay, that's a linear inverse problem. And problem two is quadratic. It's saying given the data and given the noise covariance and assuming that, and I know that's an assumption, you know, like there's a zero mean, you know, signal field and we want to know the spectral density and yes, it's isotropic, but that's not a limitation. That's just for this illustration. Let's assume that that's the object of interest how do you estimate the power of spectral density in a statistically appropriate way using this machinery? Well, so if noising we data, problem one is find the signal, problem two is find the spectral density of the signal. Two different statistical problems, right? It's not like once you found one, you squared, you have the other. That's not the same statistic. So finding the signal, if you're writing the least squares problem and you have data, and you have spherical harmonics because you know that's just as good as basis. And if you have data only in the region, then the least squares estimate for what the signal is, if you write it down analytically, depends on the inverse of that operator that shows you the coupling between these um, modes due to the sky cut. 
I've also shown you that this D has like really, really low eigenvalues, so you cannot invert it, and that's where the truncation comes in. Because you couldn't do this in spherical harmonics, or you'd have to build in thresholds or water levels or whatever people do to get rid of the quelling of the eigenvalues, as people call it. After transformation, you achieve regularization by truncation, not take all the components and then have to do something to their weight, but rather say, okay, I'll, I'll probe the space for when these eigenvectors will become less important, and you, you regulate the uh, variance bias by truncation. And then the solution is easy. Then basically it's what I just did is you take the data, you project it onto the function and you use the inverse eigenvalue and you have your signal. So all of that, or, you know, that's the essence of solving a least squares problem of something on a global or local basis when you have only local data. So we did that for things like Greenland ice melting, you know, where, you know, at the time we're like, okay, so what's the, what's the melt of ice? Where is it and when is it? You know, on the left is the picture of a decade of, of Greenland's mass loss. On the right is the integral over the area. And so this is how we measure, you know, the signal of melting due to, um, you know, ultimately climate change. Antarctica, and this picture didn't come out as well on the left, but, you know, there is patterns of melting. We made a little Slepian basis just for West Antarctica and all the other regions, but this is the one I'm showing. That's where most of the mass loss is concentrated. Right? So just keeping satellites in orbit, thereby measuring geopotential variations, and then knowing that that stuff is all really noisy, but then knowing that you're looking at Antarctica and saying, ah, I've got about 60 harmonic degrees to play with, and I'll see what I can make for this region of potential interest, Invert, you know, it's more complicated than just that. But anyway, at the end of the day, you've got, you know, an answer of what is um, the mass doing in this region. Why is why is that better than just uh, averaging the data over the, the red region? Because so the longer story is that before we used to do it this way, people did what you're saying. And then they, they did, especially for out for Greenland, the first paper was, we can't really resolve it. And so we'll just have all of Greenland. The next paper was, we'll do half of Greenland. And then people have been, you know, breaking it down further. But at some point, you're working in a very inconvenient and very poorly theoretically justified basis when you're just doing averaging. We are averaging. We are averaging according to footprints that are mutually orthogonal and that project a signal onto things with statistical properties that we know and, and understand much better than if you just sort of smooth it and average. But people do do that, right? So it's better because it works better. It's more efficient. It's theoretically justified and we understand the statistics. And the, the average is not just the zero order Slepian function. Um, well, the, um, you know, in, in some way, yes, but then you don't have a spatial pattern, right? And assuming that you could build a V proper averaging kernel, in fact, you know, like I can point to papers, people who did that to try to get the best average. It's not just a zeroth order slapping function because the zeroth order is like a little dome inside that doesn't actually cover it. It's the sum of the slapping function that covers it all. So we will come to the same average, but then you don't have a spatial pattern. Right? I don't necessarily, as a geoscientist, want to know this. Much more interested in that because it tells me where the mass is happening because these could be individual streams or glaciers or things like that. And in Antarctica, the response, I'm not showing you all of it, but there is areas in Antarctica that have mass growing. You know, right there, mass is growing. And, you know, here it's neutral and there is it. And so you can target spatially. So, you know, like who would replace a spatial pattern with just an average? If you have the average and you understand, if you have the spatial pattern, and you understand it, then there is a motivation for that. But then you'd say, could you average it with smaller things? You could, of course, do that. In the mass comms is what people used in, you know, older time, but they built specific patches of lunar area that they were interested in. So there's all sorts of connections with that. So what exactly is the uh, base function? Is that 
some eigenfunction given the given the boundary condition? Yeah, so it's the eigenfunction of the operator that says starting from all of spectrum and all of space. What if I spectrally project it and then spatially project it? That gives a whole new function basis. So X, <coughs> Fourier transform of X, cut, inverse Fourier transform, cut, you know, that's the full operator. And then you have an eigenfunction of that. So problem two is finding the spectrum. And so Let's just say that you said, well, I have data on the sphere when I want the Fourier components, but really I'm limited to R, but let's say you're just doing that and you're squaring, and that is you know, what we would call a, a boxcar type of spectrum. Everyone knows that's bad. Um, Schuster came up with that in 1898 for solar oscillations, and in the 60s, Thompson and others you know, called it spectacularly bad because it has side lobes and leakage and it's poorly behaved and it, it, it's actually statistically inconsistent it, it like the more data you throw at it it doesn't get better and so it's it's sort of got these issues so you know long story short is we understand what you do when you do that we understand why the mean square error behaves a certain way and we find ways of doing a better job so this is the multi-taper estimate. So we take the data and we're multiplying it by the slapping function, this new function basis, which exists on the whole sphere. And it smoothly cuts out the piece of the data that is uh, confined to the area. And then you Fourier transform it to spherical harmonic and then you square sum an average. And then you weight by the high value. And the point is that once again, we completely literally understand the statistics of this series of operation, right? So the very, very early papers of Peebles and Hauser, they wrote essentially, they understood this, they understood the coupling, and they understood that you have to window it somehow with a taper. What they didn't have is they didn't understand that their first window, which they chose a little bit, you know, this way or that way, was in fact an element of a whole function basis, which has mutually orthogonal components, which give you the ability to average and control the vertical error bar of your uh, spectrum. And so that's where also, you know, Tegmark and Cosmology wrote a lot of papers about squeezing the horizontal error bar and squeezing the vertical error bar. And the squeezing of the horizontal error bar, the coupling between the harmonics was well known. The squeezing the vertical error bar is, a, is, is afforded by the fact that you have a whole orthogonal basis to draw upon, which reduces the covariance between those estimates to something that actually does go down as one over the square of the or other in the graph. Uh, All right, here you have the noise covariance. You yeah. Know. So right here, I, I, I'm skipping over things, but in 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 our procedure, we um, explicitly. I'll show you in a second. I, I'm not showing the math, but I'll show you the, the result of the picture. I'm going to skip over this um, to show you an example. Right. So this would be the black line. Let's take L equals thirty. The black line is, you know, let's call it CMB spectrum. Right. It's one run of whatever you call it, lambda CLM. And the gray area is some detector noise pulled out of the paper. And like, this is what is, you know, uh, uncertainty. And the white dots are the estimates using these functions and the weightings and the iterations and the noise removal. And the whole key here is that you have this bandwidth to play with. And the larger you take this bandwidth of the sensitivity, the more you're able to reduce the error bar, but the less you know horizontally. That's the full bias variance trade-off. So if you're here e equals 30, like then every 60 degrees away, you have um, a completely 
almost completely independent estimate, which gives you the ability to average over it to reduce the error this way. And if you want more spectral resolution, you get worse vertical error bar. And if you want a lot less spectral resolution, then you have you know very small error bars. So all we are saying, right, is that if you know these bases and you do the work of characterizing the signal and the noise and write it out to the end, then we completely understand the statistics of an estimate made on the basis of that. And so if we've written this out. We have the coupling kernels. We have the variance terms. You know, you could just basically do it. We know the decay. We know what happens. If you want to target a specific area, then that's done. That's available. So, um, other things. This is a, a geomagnetic satellite. This is another geomagnetic satellite. So, we are quite busy in the community on our own planet, try to keep track of our own magnetic field, not just because the internal dynamics of the Earth make a change, but also because we care to map it and we do this for ultimately exploration and, and to understand the dynamics of the Earth. This is one of these renderings. This is a picture I did not make. Um, this is looking at Spain, which is here. Yeah, the outline is there. And you're looking at the, you know, the North Atlantic, and you're seeing this telltale sign of literally plate tectonics in there. And what's the color? It's just the ups and downs of the vertical uh, component of the Earth's magnetic field that is not generated by the core. So it's as if you were walking across the ocean crust with a magnetometer, and it would just tell you what the strength of the field is, but you know, one particular component. So it's so a magnetic global magnetization of the minerals. Yes. So this is what we call the crustal or the lithospheric magnetic field, because the uh, as the you know the core makes an active field, this field inductively couples with it, but that sort of picture is used for us to be able to say, aha, yeah, literally, every mineral is a little magnet, and if there's any organization to it, that's what we're mapping. And you're all seeing the massive organization of the ocean crust, which is literally geology 101, that the ocean crust was once not existing, then it was formed from liquid rock, then it spread, then it uh, recorded in itself the reversals of the field. So through 180 million years of growth of the crust in the Atlantic, the Earth has flipped its magnetic field multiple, multiple times, and every one of those bands is recorded in the magnetic field, is how we map all sorts of features. But that's from space satellites. So this is gotten by removing the some other for it's, it's removing ionospheric effect, it's removing core dynamics effect, it's, it's basically trying to reduce it to the field that is generated closely to our own feet. And in the 1950s, people did it with an actual ship and they towed a magnetometer at depth. Here now we're doing this from space. But, you know, the technology, of course, is different, but like the premium, again, is on trying to localize and find what matters and what the signal and noise is and what the areas of interest are, and, you know, and then questions are being asked. The oh, core is removed just by removing all the low. The core is uh, modeled. The core field is modeled, right? So the, the 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 every five years, an international committee literally agrees on what the best five year model is of the core. This is the International Geomagnetic Reference Field, and they published order seventeen spherical harmonic coefficients and derivatives because every five years it noticeably visually changes if I were to plot in fact I do it for my class and you're like you're seeing the core field change and so as a, we have to keep track of that because it's what we use for navigation it's what we use for you know all sorts of things for underground drilling to label airports you hear these stories in the news of you know an A becomes a B because the compass nail deviated a little bit, and so that's actively, actively mapped. Plus, the magnetospheric field is remote. I mean, it's, it's fluctuating because yeah. of the connectivity. Well, so there is, you know, there is a thing about, I'll show a little bit of that if I make it, but it, this is, you know, like you have to target certain data, there's time averaging, there's nighttime, there's this and that, and so those things are all part of the plotting. But by the time we're done, or that is done, uh, we're having something that we can explore and look at. 
but I'll, I'll talk in a second about it. So maybe I'll skip over this, but if you just wanted to like oceans versus continents, you know, and you could like do localized analysis, which I'm going to slip, uh, skip over in the interest of time. I've said all of this. I'm going to skip a little bit over this and, and well, maybe I'll sit here. Like this is Mars. Okay. So all the same things, but now we're looking at a completely different planet and a different type of crustal behavior. And among the questions that we ask is what explains particular flux passes in Martian field? Is it related to the crust? Was what was the dynamo like and you know two billion years ago? Was it even still there? You know, those are the questions. The line here that's marked is this hemispheric dichotomy, which is a huge crustal boundary that you see. You also see the gravity field. And so we're trying to relate, you know, the pictures, essentially trying to relate gravity, topography, magnetics with the large scale global evolution of Earth and planets. This is a Martian example. So here is a, a this is the third and final problem. Okay, so everything's gotten a little bit more complicated when you're in, in space gravity, because that's more on the exploring edge of things. If you're looking at Earth, there was entire labs doing all these things of space weather, magnetospheric, this and ionospheric modeling. But if you're out on the planets, you know, there is less available. So we're, we're closer to the data. So here's a satellite. This is a planet. And so what we're actually trying to do now is to try to study pieces of the planet with an internally generated field and potentially a frozen field. And not only do we see it, you know, um, we're seeing an internally generated field at the height of our, out of our uh, satellite, but we're also um, seeing the externally generated field from other things, including, you know, solar effects. So here the problem is like the previous one, we would have data, you know, in a region. The data will be a gradient of an internal field potential and a gradient of an external potential and a noise term. And so if the region of interest is the whole sphere, there is not a, it's not an interesting problem because that's literally what you do with spherical harmonic expansion. But once again, if you're having only partial coverage or a partial interest, you need to find the coefficients of this field and you need to not, you need to decouple them from the external fields. And uh, in, if this were tensor, this would be the same with polarization analysis. If you only have a piece of the sphere and you want to separate it for two different polarizations, then if it's all sphere, it's all orthogonal and all the terms cancel. But if it's partial sphere, there is cross term. And this is exactly what we're doing. So that's our problem is to find the coefficients of the internally generated field in a piece of the planet, knowing that it's being bombarded with you know, other fields from other things. And so now I would just, you know, go quickly and say, well, scale of harmonics become vector harmonics. Don't need to uh, um, say this. I'll just show you what actually happens when you're doing the estimation. So these are all vector harmonics now, and there are the parts that are good for the internal field and parts for the external field. E is for what comes from the inside. F is what comes at you from the outside. We want to know this because that's Mars or Venus or whatever Earth. But we also need to co-estimate what comes from the outside. So there's that, that's part of your problem, even though it's not time dependent, right? So we could time average to make it this problem. And due to the coverage region being a, a, a patch, you get all of this coupling as cross terms. And so here, you could again throw out uh, up your hands and say, like, I'll just try to do it. But now we understand what these terms are. And knowing that these terms arise from the geographic restriction, we're just calling all of that the, you know, K here, and we're working with the eigenfunctions of that. And again, you know, you could ignore it all and say, I'll just throw it all into an SVD and I'll just, you know, diagonalize it. But here, knowing where it comes from, knowing where the geometry starts to matter, knowing what the statistics are, you can, you can do this in a much, much more justified way. And it includes 
A terms here, which I'm haven't talked about, which is the fact that the cell light will have a varying altitude and in a potential field you need to come. So if you're having a satellite which gets a field from below and a field from above, and there's strong patches or patches of interest or you know non-noisy patches, or it's half the globe because you're looking at nighttime, then the statistical estimation problem requires solving this, which requires inverting this matrix, which has all of these issues of low eigenvalues and couplings that we understand theoretically. So because we do, we start to define its basis and then we extend our field in that. Um, and so, you know, we studied that and then we show that uh, that works. So because it's five, two, I just want to say, well, look, we're solving inverse problems that are statistically understandable and that are geometrically sort of polluted by restricted areas of interest. And ultimately, many of these problems are reduced to something where you do know an SVD. You know, if you work in a basis circle harmonics, you can write down the inverse operator by, you know, by ultimately not that hard. Because that exists, we also know what happens when we find tailor-made functions that respect the geometry ahead of time. And that's back to the point of wavelengths. It's a, it's a geometric a priori. If you know where the cross terms come from and you know how to uh, deal with them, then you're uh, pre-guarding um, yourself against ill pose, this instability, you know, the blow up of, of uh, low terms and so on, the stuff that is the, uh, you know, in practice, people would numerically regularize, they would do trial and error, they would do something more clever. But here, the whole point is that you can take it slightly further analytically and statistically, because you know what's going on. Um, and wanted to finish on time. So, um, many of these things were known in time series, many of these things were known in Cartesian space. Many of these things are ignored because you could just do it and do numerical things. But my message here is that if you know slightly more about the nature of the statistical pollution that you get from having partial coverage, whether it be for a scalar field you're measuring or a vector field or a tensor field, and you want to target specific things, then it pays to take these types of expansions because then you really do need a new basis to expand your problems in. Because then, with a little luck and with some advanced symmetry, many of these things become very simple and very easily understood. Does it help with the Gibson on? Well, so yes, right? I mean, like, but ultimately no, right? Because, you know, you truncate anything, you're going to feel it. So if you have the, you know, inclination to read more of our papers, we write down the effects of truncation, right? So our, our normal way of doing things is there will be an infinitely wideband unknown signal. We're going to cut it. That means we're not seeing that. There's your Gibbs phenomenon in some sense, but so what we work out is what is the coupling of that thing, which you can never observe, into the things that you observe, and so you have an omission error, and you have a commission error, and so, you know, like, that then leads to squares and squares, because it all couples to one another, but, you know, for these relatively simple cases, you can literally write it down by hand, and then we have done that, and that's my message here. So I didn't tell anything about the Earth other than uh, uh, yeah, when it's melting. That's it. That helps. <laughs> so. Originally, my reason to be here was that I thought that you should do CMB polarization with these functions, if you remember a while ago. And I'm thinking that problem has run away because people are doing it numerically. And then there still may be some additional understanding of statistical behaviors, but you know that's why I didn't really pursue it. But the tensor case has been completely taking up there's literature about it and the magic of commutation and you know, the special operators, it all carries over. And so it, it's, it's completely tight now in, in terms of one now understands the nature of space spectral localization for scalar vector tensor fields 
and the statistics relating to it. And yeah. Yes, so can I have a question? Um, so this remind me of uh, another regularization uh, method which it, where you don't need to have a hard truncation, yeah. but trying to have a, a tail of yeah. the regularization and, and, and still, I mean, although you cannot inverse the matrix, but you can still do some pseudo inversion yeah. and that gets a estimation. Do you think that can um, improve this significantly or not? Significantly? Yeah, well, so like it's, we're doing exactly that, but I'm not showing all of that, okay. right? In the example here, like make a cut, you get the physical idea. But in our earlier papers, we we're saying, well, what if, how would you do it up? What is the optimal cut? What is the rate of these cuts? And so any variation between hard cut and soft cut, one basis or another, those are all acceptable regularization techniques. And so the, the, the least squares Wiener filtering one is, you know, you divide by the signal of noise and you end, you know, like that sort of thing. So it all carries over. And so it's not all or nothing, but to, in the interest of representation, I just made it a little bit quicker. I also wonder um, what's limiting the ability to uh, to get uh, to measure sharp structures in, in, in these data. Is it also because of the noise at high frequencies, higher, or mainly because of the Effect. Do you mean lines in the spectrum, if there are a spectrum, or oh, sharp sorry, edges? It's a mean of the, uh, the estimating the, the, the signal itself, not the, not the power spectrum. Okay. Is sharpness in the? Uh, yeah, in the field, like sharp structure. Yeah, well, so, so. It, I mean, if you do a quotation, right, usually you just yeah. abandon. Well, those so lines. it's for those problems that we ultimately do wavelets because they are able to honor boundaries because you can do wavelets on an interval and then you could, you know, hop to the next piece of support. In what I've shown here, the magnetic field is never sharp. The gravity field is never sharp because even though you may have one rock of one density next to another rock of density at satellite altitude, you know, the modes have decayed and blended. And so that's why these things are never sharp. But in order to look for things with sharpness, I wouldn't use any of this, but I would go to things with different ways of, of uh, edge uh, preserving regularization. And that's, you know, then you get into different bases and different norms in particular. Square norms don't do well with that. This is where L1 norms and so on come in. But that's an interesting uh, problem because that's, you know, when we talk about the interior of the planet and we represent, you know, one place next to the other, the property will be sharp. The intrinsic property could be very sharp. Ocean, continent, inside, outside. But the field that gives rise to it, you know, especially measured from satellite, especially if it's a potential field, decays and then you get the modes that decay at different uh, frequencies and then loses the sharp. But in order to get the sharp uh, intrinsic structure, do you need the signal from high frequency? Well, so that's, so in general, that's called downward continuation, right? So you're measuring a decayed signal. And so it's spectrum from left to right is like this at satellite altitude. And you're trying to bring it down to where it wouldn't have that feature. And so this is what we do for the interior of the Earth. We're trying to, like, I didn't talk about that at all, but if you're interested in the core field, then you not only need to bring it down from satellite, like you need to bring it down, not just to the surface, but all the way down to the core in order to see whatever sharpness there is. But you know, that's another, but that's generally the, the problem of the, of the distance dependent harmonic power dependent decay of any potential field that we're always trying to invert, correct for, downward continue, preserve whatever the term of the art is. The advantage like would go down as your mass becomes like more and more complex. I guess if you have holes and things like that, your mask then I mean the, the, the truncation, I mean you have to truncate. Well, so if you look at the spectrum, it, like, it, like in the linear problem, technically, like mathematically, you only need a pebble size of the moon's gravity measured to imprint precision to know the whole thing. 
and such is the nature of a group, the gravitational potential. In the quadratic problem, technically, it doesn't matter how holy it is, the spectral density, the horizontal and the vertical error bars thereof really only matter based on the amount of area that you cover. Those are counterintuitive results, but they're mathematically precise. And so you can cook up an example of saying like, make me a holy cheese and build me a curl. And then I'll say, yeah, I could do it. And then there's practical applications. Oh, I forgot the bonus slide, but um, somebody asked me to do something <laughs> general. Like, okay, so a cat in space and a duck in spectral space, what are the eigenfunctions? This is the complete coverage of spectral, of spatial space and this is complete coverage of spectral space. This is an, a, a diagonalization of this slepkin lambda polar operator. And then these are the eigenfunctions. You know, you get specific modes. These are the first three. Okay. So you might, and this is what uh, Srijan Das is doing for solar magnetics. He's like, you know, I want to cut out this little bit of a sunspot, but actually I'm expecting waves coming from one direction. And so can we build a basis to project a likely structure on it that will be know, specifically sensitive. And so if you're asking which function has a Fourier transform that is almost confined to a catch to a duck shape reflected on the pond because it has to be symmetric. And, you know, looks like a cat, well, that's the first mode and that's the second. And these are all orthogonal functions and that's the new basis. And so, yeah, you could do it in Fourier basis and truncate and you could do it in a way you would and play with it. But that's the basis for the space where the cat and the duck live together. You know, and that's uh, that comes all the way from the completely symmetric circular everything. You know, like that theory is from the fifties. This is we've left analyticity because you know it's not a parameterized cat; it's an actually pixelated cat. But you can target waves, modes, directions, and whatever. If you know something about the probe that you want to have in spectral space and you know something about the region or you can only do a certain kind of a region, then you can build a basis for it. Cartesian, vector scalar, spherical, you can do it. Volume, people have done volumetric. So. Thank you.